I'm going to start with the SIP registration. Uh, we're going to walk through this flow again. Um, in a common troubleshooting mistake is that uh, folks will overlook where the packet is coming from and to. But the way SIP was put together, you can't reliably look at the SIP headers and determine where the packet was coming from and to. The expectation is that you always have access to the IP header so that you, all, you always, for example, can see the source IP and the destination IP address when you're trying to troubleshoot. So what we show in, in, for purposes of training is I give a little diagram that shows where the packet is coming from and to with a, to give you that picture. When you look at this in a packet capture type scenario, it's gonna be different. You're gonna look at source and destination IP address and we'll get a chance to uh, spend a little time together in Wireshark doing just that. So uh, let's look at some SIP headers. We're gonna look at SIP registration, authentication, placing calls, negotiating codecs, talking to a network server, which is a redirect server, PSDN gateway, how we end the call, and then call hold and resume. So first, registration. Um, what we see here at the top is the, the phone sending in the, uh, the packet. And so this gray arrow represents where this packet uh, is on the network. And uh, so we're captured, capturing a SIP message sent from the phone to the untrusted or access interface on the, um, on the uh, session border controller. So here we've got uh, the S session border controller has an untrusted interface and a trusted interface. Uh, and then we have the, um, the core network here described on in these three green uh, boxes, green being the color of trust in network diagrams in, in uh, many cases. So we have the SIP registration, uh, the SIP register message occurring here where um, we have the from header and the to header. They both have the same SIP address of record. And so that SIP address of record is really fundamental to identifying the user. In this case, it's SIP 919. 7400628 at vwave.net. And we've got that same value in both the from and the to header. Uh, then we have the contact, and the contact is the address of record at the moment. So this is the, you notice this one's got a private IP address, um, and that private IP address would be the IP address of the uh, calling SIP device, or the registering SIP device in this particular case. And we also see some other information. For example, the user agent shows that it's a particular model of Polycom phone. Um, here. The, um, so this registration was sent in and the, uh, the SIP device is basically making an assertion that this particular user, SIP colon 919-740-628, is on the network at this particular contact address, uh, which is, as you can see, part of that is 919, I'm sorry, 192-168-200.89. And so the, um, the, the system should uh, send SIP traffic for this address of record for this user identity to that IP address. So this is going to the untrusted interface of the SBC. And in many cases, if you're gonna have a packet capture system, a system like um, the Empirics call analyzer, then you're gonna put it in a place where you can see the untrusted interface of your session border controller. Uh, Oracle Communication Operation Monitor, OCOM is another really popular tool for doing the same kind of thing. So, um, Next, we'll see the register leaving the core side or the trusted side of the session border controller. And so when we, when we see it leave that trusted side, it's been modified. And then the key thing to notice here is that the contact has been modified. So the contact here is the contact that will be used by the core of the network to reach this user. The session border controller is the route to get back to the user. So we're, we're not gonna send uh, from the core of the network, we're not, not gonna send traffic directly to the private IP of the uh, of the client. In fact, the private IP of the client is probably not reachable in general because we're going through NAT gateways. And when we get to the session border controller content next week, we're going to talk about how that NAT process works in, in a lot of detail. But um, the SBC is replacing the uh, contact with one that allows the SIP transactions to reach the SBC. And then the SBC does any kind of NAT um, or TCP or TLS or any kind of other interworking that's necessary to get the traffic back to the, uh, to the device. So um, we see that the address of record has not changed because that's really the identity of the user that's, that's registering. So the, the SPC is gonna function as a kind of custodian for this user. Uh, we see that the next thing that happens is that the application server sends back a 401 and authorized uh, challenging this registration. And this is how the authentication process works. And so it sends back a challenge with this nonce value. This nonce is basically 
a, a randomly generated uh, string that's used as part of the hash uh, that's going to be used to generate the hash later on. So at this point, this is a SIP response. And so if we go back, go back one slide, we can see this is a SIP request, the register request, and this is, this is the response. And as I mentioned uh, last time, request and responses come in pairs, and the, uh, the request here was for um, the registration process, and we need a final response. The final response code is 401. So the, this, this register got a final 401 response. We did not see any provisional responses, so anything starting with a one would have been provisional. We didn't get any of those. We also did not get any kind of successful response, such as a 200, to indicate that it was successful. So we got a register uh, failure in effect, uh, but this register failure is the mechanism that is used for the authentication process. So the next thing that happens is we see the SBC send back the register to the phone. It leaves the www authenticate header uh, basically intact with the same nonce value. Following that, the phone is going to compute the appropriate response value. So it's going to concatenate the uh, SIP address of record, the domain name, which is v, uh, including the domain name vwave.net. It's going to concatenate the password, the secret password that's stored and configured in the phone, and it's going to concatenate in the response and a couple of value, other values as well. Sorry, it will concatenate in the uh, nonce value, and then it'll take the MD5 hash of that. Uh, in this particular case, this algorithm is MD5. So it'll generate a hash from that. So that's a, a string of characters that's uh, cryptographically difficult to uh, reproduce um, without having the original data in the first place. But practically, it's a secure way to do encryption uh, of, the, uh, of the string of values. It's not a reversible encryption. So it's just a way of generating a value that can be checked later. So by having this response value here, an attacker will not be able to reverse it and readily discover the password um, under any current uh, known computing. This is not uh, quantum safe, so there's effort and on a lot of modern systems, you'll see them using uh, algorithms other than MD5 uh, in order to do this kind of thing. So if we had effective and a, a quantum computing, then uh, you potentially could compute all the possible options and discover what the password is. So, um, here we get this authorization header, and this serves as evidence provided by the SIP phone. You see how this is being sent by the SIP phone. Serves as evidence sent by the SIP phone to indicate that um, it has the appropriate password. So this is going to pass to the SBC unchanged in this particular scenario. The SBC is not doing anything except for modifying that contact um, header there. And then at this point, the uh, SIP phone, I'm sorry, the SIP application server will say yes. This device is registered. This is the appropriate username and uh, password. All the right values were present to generate that response uh, because it was computed locally inside the application server as well. And so the application server was going to be able to uh, accept the registration and it's going to store that registration for 3,599 seconds, which is one second short of an hour. Um, and that means that the application server is making a commitment to remember the location of this user for an hour. And then we're going to see this going back. Now, this particular session border controller is not modifying that expiration time. So this may be appropriate, for example, if you have uh, SIP over TLS or SIP over TCP, where you have TCP keep alive instead of SIP uh, regular re registration. What we're going to look at later when we look at session border controller uh, next week in general is that it's much more common to actually have a shorter re-registration time here. And so you would see in that case a re-registration time of say 30 seconds uh, on the leg between the session border controller and the SIP phone. So now this user is registered, the phone knows that it's registered, the session border controller knows that it's registered. And so on a lot of SBCs, they're going to use this authentication process to determine the trust level to apply. Because this user successfully registered, the SBC can have some certainty that this is actually a trustworthy user, which is to say a trustworthy IP address and port number that they're sending traffic from, and therefore resources can be granted to that user to make calls. If this user continued to attempt to register and never successfully registered, then that may be uh, evidence that the SBC could use to detect fraud. So, oh, this user continues to register this IP address and port number, never successfully gets registered. They never show that they have the right username and password. Maybe this is just an attacker. And so maybe uh, we should clamp down traffic and block traffic or slow traffic going to and from uh, these IP addresses. <laughs>